Authentic communication is felt, not just heard. People feel authentic communication, whether you recognize it or not. When you are speaking to somebody and, you know, let's the cashier at the coffee shop you went to this morning and you look them in the eye and you say, I hope you have a nice day. And you mean it when you say it, they will be able to tell, heard. And it's done in the moment then is what I hear you say. In the moment, exactly. But it comes from your legitimate effort. Do you legitimately want to say, hey, I hope you have a nice day? Because if you do, you should. And even sometimes when you don't, you should try to. And that level of connection, just human to human connection, grows exponentially when you focus on it. And then when you put it into a work context and focus it even further, you can make a huge impact. Hello, everyone. It's time for another episode of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast. And today, it's going to be a cool show where I, your host, Dr. Jim Hoven, get a chance to visit with, while you know I talk to cool people every day, today is a cool of cool people, one of my favorite people in the world, and someone who makes a huge difference. Just like you're making a difference, this guy makes a difference in our business. His name is Bradford, and we call him BK for short because I, you're just my guy, BK. And, uh, and so what we wanted to talk about today was the important role of everyone in an organization. In other words, there are no unimportant roles. And and so uh, for those of you watching or listening, you may find yourself in a role where you're a CEO of a company. You may find yourself in a role where you're in your own business, or you may find yourself where you're not quote unquote, one of the top people. And either way, our goal today is to have a conversation with you to let you know that your role is important. And if you are quote unquote at the top, that everyone that is working with you to get a job done, their role is important too. So Bradford, welcome to another episode of the show, my friend. I, mean, I like epidition, if epidition. you want to call it an epidition. Yeah. Well, you know, you're a wordsmith. Version. Yeah, you're a wordsmith. So I thought I would combine something for you. Uh, well, you impressed me on the first <laughs> shot. So well done. Epidition. epidition. I got to write that down. Yeah, somewhere. So um, Bradford, give a little bit before we go too deep into this topic, give a little bit of background about you, what you do here at the law firm and how you're literally helping teams of people at every level make a difference. Sure. So um, I started as somebody that answers the phone, helps identify cases and get them signed. It was one of the first people that was taught how to identify motor vehicle accidents and get them signed up on our intake team. And that's where I'm primarily stationed now is working with the intake team and our director of client services to help make sure that that team, which is continuing to grow, gets the sort of development that they need and they can have those same skills, right? So we went from, you know, five or six people to now we've got almost more than 20 that are doing that same job. And so it's my job to help support that staff. And then we found opportunities to grow staff in other areas as well. And so I'm able to connect with other staff members in other departments and help them develop and grow using the virtual assistant program that we started with our intake team. That's so beautiful. And, and, you know, I think the reason that I wanted uh, to especially talk about this with you of all people is because of number one, your background, you came to us with zero legal background, zero. Mm -hmm. And you have this incredible gift of a mind that works in a whole bunch of ways at one time. You have this incredible gift to be a chef. You have these hobbies that are eccentric and cool with the games that you play and the things that you do. And you brought that to us in this format. What did you think coming in when you basically said, I want a job, just give me something to do. Did we make you feel like your role was important? And what did you think of your role at the time before you had any of the cultural experience? That's a good question. So you are right. When I walked into the place and and asked to work here, I wasn't expecting anything other than like, hey, just, you know, if you have a stack of papers that need sorted, I'll sort them, right? I know they're all white and it's all black ink, but I can figure out which ones (laughs) go in which piles. Like, I'll do whatever you need me to. And I knew that if I had that attitude, I would find myself useful or I find something useful to do. And when I, you know, the first few days on the job where it was like, hey, you need to answer the phone and you need to talk to these people. You need to figure out what's wrong and then you need to find a solution. There's more technical, like you can get into the details of like, oh, what, what are they calling about and where do I need it? You can, but overall, that's what I was asked to do. Answer the phone, talk to someone, figure out what they need and find a solution for them. Did it seem important when you were asked to do it or did you make it feel important? What, how did you take ownership of that? By breaking it down to something that simple mm-hmm. is what made me recognize how important my job was. So it's very easy to feel like, oh, I just answer the phones here or so I just transfer calls to someone here. I was like, no, what you're doing is literally the front line of one of the most important things this firm can do, which is accept accept phone calls from people that need help, mm-hmm. receive someone's request. That's what you're doing. 
If you're going to be the steward of someone's request like that, then you need to recognize the importance of how of that thing that you're carrying from one place to another, right? And if if you don't consider that job important, then it's really not going to matter if let's say that entire cup of water comes from the well and goes back to the village. Truth is, is that even though it may not be feel important or from that perspective to pick it up and bring it over to where you are. The reality is when you break it down to something that simple, you are fielding someone's request. Without the ability of people to field those requests, we won't be able to fill them. Then it was much easier for me to kind of recognize the importance of my position. I think a combination of the way that the business's culture is set up and my own drive to solve problems is what made me ultimately feel how important I was when I started in that position. That is so cool. And when you were looking for wins to validate the importance, because it's always easy for us to go, oh yeah, you know what? I'm important, I'm, this is important, this, we assign that. And sometimes we have to fake it till we make, we make it, but mm -hmm. did you have little wins that made you, that affirmed that, that it really made a difference as you're talking to these people? Because they're calling, in our, you know, in the case of everyone's situation is different, but in our world, these people are calling it some of the worst times of their life, yeah. where their world is upside down, and you only get one chance to make a first impression, as they say, and so what, what was it, obviously your drive and some of the culture, we can talk about those for sure, but d what is it that finally cemented it for you emotionally that, wow, this truly is critical? I think that there were a couple of phone calls in my first few weeks here where I felt what you're talking about. This is somebody who's calling us in one of the worst times in their life and they are not doing well, whether that be mentally, emotionally, physically, etc. I mean, most frequently it's physically, right? I have been injured. But then being able to talk with them on the phone, assuage them of their fears, and then there were there was a couple times I can specifically remember where I had to take a, take a gamble and be like, I legally have no idea if we're gonna be able to help this person, but it sounds like we're gonna be able to. So I'm gonna say, you know what? Sounds like something we can help with. Let me get you connected with an attorney. And after getting them connected with an attorney, I would always follow up and say, hey, attorney, this is what I said, this is what I was thinking, this is what made me think that we were gonna be able to help this person, was that correct? I think in one week I got three yeses from our various attorneys or various other like team leads and I'm like, okay, I'm figuring it out. And not only am I figuring out, but like this is why I'm here. I'm here to make sure that these people get what they're looking for and I'm accurately identifying what they're looking for. And I think that, that was the click for me. As wow. soon as I felt that, I'm like, yep, this is where I wanna be, this is what I wanna do. I think that's a nugget, um, Bradford. I think that if you look at what people need oftentimes in any new position especially, they need feedback, right? And they need it frequently. If it's something brand new, you need frequent, frequent feedback as opposed to if you've been doing the same thing like what you do now, you're so skilled at it that the feedback that you require is less unless it's a new, angle right. to your thing. Mm -hmm. would, would you say that that is a true case, not only in this scenario, but also in other scenarios where people are, let's say, not making the decisions, they're just taking whatever it is that they're supposed to do. Is feedback important? Generally, well, of course, feedback is important, but there's, I think there's an important distinction between the, let's say from the management perspective of like, I need to make sure that the person I'm training receives feedback on their work, right? Any manager or trainer will tell you, you have to have that. Mm -hmm. But as an employee or somebody who is being managed, you also need to recognize that it is to some degree your responsibility to seek that feedback. And that's a two-way street. Now, the side of the street that the manager's on is a lot wider, but that doesn't mean that there's no room to go the other direction as well. And I think that the people that are interested in pursuing excellence, as one of our core values talks about, make that side of the street as wide as possible, right? Not only am I going to receive the feedback that I'm getting that my manager is giving to me whenever I can, but I'm also gonna to try to find opportunities to get more feedback on my own, right? And that is a recipe for success inside your first three weeks, three months, three years of wherever you're working. Yes, and I remember you, I'll never forget this. You looked at me and you were so intense when you came in this, in this office going on two years ago now. And I remember literally having you come into my office and we were talking one day about whatever we were talking about. And I think we left the office and you told me, if people don't love what they're doing, why do they just work here? Why don't they just leave and go find something else? Do you remember that conversation? Yes, I do. All full of animation and yeah. spitfire. And, and I appreciated that. And I said, man, remember this. I love that, but not everyone's wired like you are. So you have this gift that you just wanted to learn. Your gift that you, your superpower, one of them, is that you just want to know, understand, learn. Like that's a really big thing. Now that you're in a leadership position, 
is there a way that you help your team members kind of connect to that passion of what they do or to ask for feedback or to somehow be great? Because in the client services, I'll tell you, um, we have had such great feedback and, and now you can explain the role that they do as, as making sure that these people as a first line get their questions answered. And so many times they trust enough, they build enough relationship that they're just like, I wanna go with you guys to help me through that relationship. But anyway, we can come back to that. How, yeah, yeah. how do we how, answer the first part of that question? What do you as a leader do to try to instill that same fire for people to love what they do? I think, well, two sides of it, right? The first, the feedback side of it, the concept of how do you encourage somebody to use the other side of that road, right? The larger management side and you have the smaller side for the individual that you're managing. If you point the, them to those opportunities, the people that have the drive to take them will take them. You don't need everyone to take them. But the ones that do are the ones that you're gonna, you can start developing further into you know, you, the leaders of the future, right? That's mm -hmm. the folks that take that smaller path and look for those opportunities for feedback you'll be able to pick up and recognize. But then instilling passion in someone else is not necessarily easy, but it always starts with leading by example. I'm gonna show someone how passionate I am about X, Y, Z thing. If they decide to, or this, this gets them as passionate as I am, great. But instilling passion in someone is an even more challenging task than that. I don't know if there's a good way that I could I could point to and say, yes, this is what I use to instill passion in someone else. Because I don't, I don't think that comes from the outside. I think it comes from the inside. What I will tell you is that I'm more than happy to lead someone through a maze, a path, or you know wherever we're going, and allow their surroundings to inspire them to them so they can become passionate, right? It's not my, I can't put something inside someone, but I can, you know, I'll walk by all of the exhibits that made me passionate about Egyptian history, right? This just as a, as a random example, but mm -hmm. that's what I would do is, you know, hey, this is something I really enjoy. Let me take you to my, the three places I went to that inspired the passion for this subject matter. This is what got me there, right? Yes. So I'll take you there. And if it's not your bag, that's fine. It doesn't have to be. But these are the things that got me passionate about it. Now, when you move that to a work context, I'm going to do the same thing. But there is a minimum requirement here, right? Mm -hmm. You do have to still write me a paper about Egyptian history. I don't mm -hmm. need you to get inspired. I just need you to still submit me three pages on X, mm -hmm. right? Now, talk to me about this. You work with Sharissa, mm -hmm. and Sharissa and you are Robin and Batman, or Batman and Robin, yeah. or any, any duo, amazing duo right. that you guys want to talk about. What role does, so if someone out there is not in a management position, mm -hmm. but they're in a position that is, we'll just say doing it, right? Mm -hmm. As they say, doing it, doing it, doing yep. it. They're the, they're the ones making the stuff happen. And then there's this, this leadership slash management role. Tell me when, you, when you're working with Sharissa, how do you guys decide as a team, what makes our client services team function at the highest levels and how to make them um, stand apart? Because I know, you know, I've had the chance to talk with chiropractic teams from all over the country and from legal teams all over the country. And when I talk to them, our team is different. There's something noticeably and identifiably different with these people. And it starts with what you guys have created. How do you instill that, what we say, pursue excellence? That's another mm -hmm. one of our core right. values. How do you do it? Well, I think, and we don't do this, <clears throat> we don't necessarily do this consciously, but one of the things that I've noticed happens is we kind of split the, the first start. The first step is the culture that's been built here is instilling that in the team, right? And recognizing that we work together no matter what, and we've got each other's backs no matter what, and we we work on the bonding of getting to know each other better first. And so sometimes it means we take a little longer training people. Sometimes it means you know a training module that should take two weeks. Sometimes it takes two and a half. Sometimes it takes three. And it's because we are gonna take the time to focus on the individual. And we wanna make sure that we're connecting with our individuals and getting to know them. How do you do that? And I'm gonna interrupt you here because there's been times where we've brought on two new people, let's say one live and, and two people that work mm -hmm. remotely, right? One in-house, two out of house. Mm -hmm. But there's been times we've brought on nine yeah. at a time. How do you make sure that you spend time to, what are some techniques that you use to get to know people and connect them to the tribe, if you will? So Sharice and I have found that five individuals to one trainer is too many. And so we do not work individually in groups larger than four. Mm. And so we do one, one, a one to four ratio maximum. And that's if we have a group of four where at least some individuals that we're training are, are somewhat independent. 
if you can tell that some of your training group needs a little more focused attention, then we'll cut it down to three. And so then from there, once we've kind of broken up the teams a little bit, then we rotate our time, right? And so I, I focus on a lot of the subject matter and, hey, here's how, you know, the insurance, healthcare, and legal systems work in the United States. Let's talk generally. Let's understand concepts. And Cherie says much more, okay, here's what this program does. And here's how you interact with the program and interface with the program to accomplish your daily tasks. Subject matter and execution. And so that's with the di sort of division of labor that we use. And when you spread it around, everybody gets kind of an equal share of everything. But at a certain point, you do kind of have to smash it together and be like, okay, you've got your subject matter and you understand how to do the operations. It's time to execute. Right? How do you manage them then to make sure that they're continuing to grow? Because again, we get all these amazing compliments on, man, your team was so helpful. They were so amazing. And it, they've never met these people, right? They're yeah. just talking to them on the phone. How do you assure that another, you know, this pursue excellence mm -hmm. core value that we have, how do you manage that? Because for anyone now who's a manager or a leader in an organization who wants to have this kind of camaraderie, this type of, uh, this type of interconnectedness among people at all, we'll call it strata or levels within mm -hmm. the business, you have to monitor it somehow. What do you guys do for that? Well, that system that I was just talking about, breaking things into smaller groups and focusing on training in smaller groups, we've applied that to the management structure that we've built on the intake team as well. And what the way that it used to be managed was like is is very, um, we'll say, pancaked, right? A stack of pancakes is what two or three tall, right? If you're if you're stacking four pancakes at a time, you're a maniac. That's I hope a lot. they're small. That's a lot of <laughs> pancake, right? But but if you think about it traditionally, like you know, the surface area on the top of the pancake is pretty wide, right? And, and that's fine, but we were stacking them kind of on top of each other and it, it wasn't working. So we decided to change to more of a pyramid structure. The only time I'd tell you that a pyramid scheme is acceptable <laughs> is when you're building a management structure. So what we did is the same same concept, is one person is responsible for these three, right? And so that's what we did, is we broke up our team into that sort of a structure so that we don't have to check in. We can check in on any level of that and know what's going on because that individual is not gonna be overloaded with too many people to manage or too much responsibility to handle. And that's just all inside just the intake, intake structure. So, you know, we've got everyone trained up, we teach everyone how they're supposed to, what they're supposed to be doing, and then, while they're while they're executing their tasks, we can check on it's like, hey, are you are you making the appropriate progress in the appropriate areas? Are we seeing the measurable metrics improve in the correct direction? I don't necessarily need you to be a rock star in two weeks. I'm not expecting you to to you know be the second coming of whatever you know. I just need you to make sure that we're making clicks in the correct direction. And if we're seeing the clicks, then we're okay. And that's great. Anybody that clicks farther than that is going to be recognized. And that's how you find a new space on the pyramid that's higher than where you were. I, you know, I want to now take a corollary to that where if someone, it, it, how do you help transition them when you see talent? Like we've seen the talent in you and you have moved seven different directions from when you started here, right? Yeah. To where now you're helping with different departments and divisions and working with people at lots of levels and other leaders within the company. Now you are a leader within the company in a very short time, like you've really, really done well. When with our um, assistant team, right, with our client services team, sometimes they move to different departments. Are mm -hmm. you actively looking for people's strengths and their skill sets to look to match them into needs outside of maybe where their comfort zone is and help take them out? And if you're someone now like, so that's part A of the question. Part B is when you were at doing the same thing that they were, I won't say at their level, but when you were doing the same duties that they were, did you have any sort of way that you wanted to express that or any advice you might have for people that, that might want to grow and move from that position to more growth? So to address the first half of the question, the concept of identifying talent, um, I think that identifying talent and also identifying like preferential is difficult to say, but you know, somebody who prefers to do document style work instead of talking on the phone work. You, if you know your team well enough, you're gonna know that from the first couple of weeks, right? And realistically, after you've developed them, after the first month or two of training, you, you know what? I don't know if this is the best fit for you. Let's put you somewhere else. Versus somebody who after six, eight, nine months goes, hey, this is great, but I would love to learn this skill and do this other, right? If you don't have a connection with the individuals on your team, you're never gonna be able to notice that in the first place, right? Which is part of the reason why we take so much time connecting and originally. Then the second part is talent doesn't necessarily indicate that, that 
that person should be moved to a different department. And frequently, talent inside specifically the intake team shows to me, hey, I'm ready for the, a new responsibility or task inside the department. And a lot of times team members on our, on our, in our division will just raise their hand and say, hey, I'm, I'm ready for a new so-and-so. Like I've got 10 minutes to spare between this time and this time, and I'm just looking for something I can do real quick, right? And so here you go, do this real quick, right? And then all of a sudden, that just something they start doing every day. And that level of initiative is, it all comes from, in my opinion, that original connection on point number one. So are we looking for talent to move someone somewhere else? Not necessarily, but when someone raises their hand and say, hey, I really enjoy talking to people on the phone, but I'd really love to learn how to, you know, review this type of document, it's like, great. Knowing where there's needs in the firm elsewhere is something else that I've been trying to focus on. How can I identify what other departments need for staffing? And how can I identify where our staff are currently? And could they be in a better spot? Mm. Give the example of EB on how he started in one spot and you recognize, you and Sharisa recognize where he really excelled. We looked around, found out a place, and now the, the impact that he's making. It's a great example, actually, because whenever you've got somebody that is doing their, is, is doing, is in, a, in the position that they've signed up for, right? Hey, I signed up to be, let's, I'll, you know, myself, I was showed up and I started talking on the phone. If talking on the phone isn't what I'm good at, or maybe isn't what I want to be doing, there's a matching of your passion and your skills that we want to find for you inside the firm. So when we identify that there's a mismatch in that area, then finding where the best landing place is, is, a, is one of the options that we can take. And that's exactly what we did for EB in this situation, is we found an opportunity for this individual to use their skills with Excel, to use their skills with program development, to use their skills with um, data displays, to then build tools for the firm that are unique to the firm that help us identify things like average signature rate, an individual's performance in the intake team for number of intakes they're handling, number of cases they've signed, and be able to neatly and accurately display that data, which is a huge impact for the firm. And something that saved us, a, you know, and if you're speaking at it from a business perspective, it saved us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's analytical data, and that's, you know, that's something that a lot of companies will just pay for, right? And we don't, it's not that we're not paying a third party for it, it's that we can now build that inside our own team. And I think right. that's an excellent example of just the tip of the iceberg of what we could do inside our, our individual departments to make sure that that department is getting the information they need. So now tie that together with, like, I want your perspective on how these teams now integrate for the entire client experience. So um, how do you talk with your team about it or what have you noticed that says, Without this team, because again, we're talking about all roles are critical mm -hmm. in any organization, right? Whether it's a business or whether it's a nonprofit or a sports team, every single position is absolutely crucial for success. How does it tie together here at the law firm? Well, I'm going to use your sports team example. I think football is a great example because when you look at a football team of the 11 players that are on the field, don't even bother with who's on the sideline. Start with the 11 players on the field. The difference in just body type from the guy that's standing closest to the sideline to the guy who's got his hand on the ball before the snap, before the snap are two totally different people. Two different human types. Entirely. Not even close. But if you think for a second that the guy that's the wide receiver on the edge versus the guy who's snapping the ball don't both know exactly what's going on in the field at the same time, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. Because they do. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not as intense at a law firm, but the concept of each person having their own individual job but not really knowing what the other people do is a recipe for disaster. You should be, all, as a team, sitting in a team presentation about what the team is doing. In fact, I'm doing this later this week with one of our new virtual assistant hires. You're gonna take a tour of the firm with me. You're gonna learn what every department does. And you're not necessarily gonna know the details of how every department works, but you're gonna know what every department does. Because if you somehow get put on the phone with somebody who has no idea why they called or somehow you sent, you need to be able to direct them to the right place that they can find help just inside our business, right? If I come across the street with some from somebody and they ask me about something that I'm not familiar with, then I'm making a mistake because I should be familiar with this business enough to be able to direct somebody who says, hey, can you help me to where they might find help? That's beautiful. I love that so much because I get feedback about how well the team is doing everywhere and from, hey, I called Annie at the front desk or I talked with Megan or I talk to Jose and I, I hear the stories of these people that are thankful. Can you give a couple examples of um, 
stories that you've heard that because our client services team took a call that it made a difference in the lives of, of our, what then become clients, or maybe even people that we couldn't help and how it made them feel. Well, so I, I'll, the one example that I'm thinking of myself personally was in, in, when I was doing an aviation intakes, I spoke to an individual who's actually an AME doctor. And this individual's worked with LaRusso many times, great lady. And, and LaRusso, Joe LaRusso, is, he's our aviation attorney, head of aviation, works with pilots all over the country all to make sure country. that their, their stuff is good. Right, and yep. this is one of the doctors that he works with pretty closely. And I didn't know this at the time, but I'm chatting with her and you know, our, the intake is finished and we're kind of just now, we're just chit chatting the last five, 10 minutes of the call. And I re realized like, oh, you are one of our FAA AMEs, like we know we've worked with you in other places before. Mm -hmm. And then of course the conversation kicks another 10 minutes after that. We actually just recently wrapped up and, and settled our case. But uh, it was just really cool to hear from her later on down the road of this case of like, oh, this is an example of where taking some extra time and really connecting with somebody on the front end is gonna yield dividends for you down the road. Mm. And I mean, I know that's an example for me because I can immediately think of something, but I know that that's, that's indicative of our team on the intake mm -hmm. side. That's the client services team at Ramos Law right yes. there. Yes, People, we can make an impact in people's lives in just a 30 minute phone call. But you have to care, you have to want to, and you have to be in a position to know that you're supported by other caring people and other people that want that same excellence that they found for you. So true. Oh, Bradford, I'll tell you, I um, remember this so vividly. We had a, a team member here and she was working, she got hired and she was put on the intake team and she was taking calls. And um, it turns out that she was taking these calls and she came to me after maybe a month and she said, I literally am going home crying every day because I'm hearing these people's stories and it's just so hard on, on my heart. And I said, you know what? And this is where it got worse. She said, even if, especially if we can't help them. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people that, for whatever reason, if the the circumstances aren't right, they, they can't be helped with mm -hmm. what we do, right? And so thankfully, most people we can help, but in some cases we can't. And so what I told her is I said, listen, you're this person's angel. You're their ambassador. You're their, you're their next step advisor. And so if you tell them that we can't help them, that actually is, in some sense, it's at least an honest answer that says this part of the chapter is closed. Now what's your next chapter? Because it's never, right. we can't help you. It's right. we can't help you, but here's your next step. Right. Or, you know, we, we are a law office that offers legal services. That is the way that Ramos Law as a business helps you, the individual who's calling Ramos Law for those assistance. That doesn't mean that our human assistance ends there. There have been plenty of times you get off the phone with somebody and say, I'm sorry, this is just not something that we're going to be able to legally help you out with. However, here are some resources that I know of as an individual or something that I think these people may be able to help you. Let's see what we can do to get you connected with them. And that's the extra step that sets us apart. And that's why we've got those words in our, our lobby. What makes us different makes us better. Because if you're interested in doing that for somebody that calls, then it doesn't matter where they're calling from or what situation they're in. We're going to find a way to do something for that person that they wouldn't have found unless they had called us, right? And that's that level of care and attention is what I think every single person that joins this firm should hear about day one. Yes. The core values brought to life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? And our core values, for those of you that don't know, just super quickly, it's care deeply, um, communicate openly and effectively, pursue excellence in everything you do, put others first and have fun doing those things. And, you know, you have really wrapped up for us how that works. And, and I think one of the best best things we could ever have happen when someone talks to you or they talk to Annie or Sharissa or, you know, Megan, and all of a sudden they say, here's what I love to hear. You know, that person just kind of made my day. Yeah. Whether it's, great. whether it's a, a healthcare, one of the doctors that we work yeah. with, one of our clients, a client that we, a person who wants to be a client, we just can't help them. When they say that was just a really pleasant phone call. Mm -hmm. then you or your t one of the people on your team made that person's day better yeah. than when they called. That's adding value to their life. 100%. Do you feel that every yes. day? Yeah. Well, and, and so, and I think that a, a practical application of that feeling is uh, the title that Miss Annie holds as the director of first impressions. I think Ooh, that's brilliant. so good. I think it's brilliant because that's exactly, that's exactly what you're doing is you are 
to the person that answers that is on the other side of that call the first impression that they get of us and tying that into our core values and living that out every day showing up and living that out at work or otherwise that's a really i think one of the biggest difference that i've seen and one of the reasons why i love being here like this this is the sort of stuff that takes you from good to great and from great to excellent and so i want to wrap up with this going good to great and great to excellent for me it all comes down to really a couple of concepts but the one i want to focus on is connecting mm -hmm. i think if i were to talk about it in one direction it would be foolish but rather in two directions or maybe multiple directions say if i can connect with you and you and i have a great connection because we've built it we've spent the mm -hmm. time we've put in the effort to have this relationship and then if we're connected we know that we're connected to the values of this business the vision and the mission of what dr ramos has set up what we're trying to do and then we try to extend that connection out, not only to people who might be calling us, but to the community when we're out there, to our family so we can give our best to them. What do you say about the art of connecting with people? How do you do it? Well, how is a difficult and large question. <laughs> what I will tell you is that authenticity and um, not legitimate, but authentic communication is easily identifiable. People feel authentic communication, whether you recognize it or not. When you are speaking to somebody and, you know, let's the cashier at the coffee shop you went to this morning and you look them in the eye and you say, I hope you have a nice day. And you mean it when you say it, they will be able to tell. They hear it every day, all the time. Have a nice day, right? We all, we all mm -hmm. thank you, enjoy the rest of your, whatever else those salutations are. But, but authentic communication is felt, not just heard. And it's recognized. done in the moment then is what in I hear you say. In the moment, yeah. exactly. But it comes from your legitimate effort. Do you legitimately want to say, hey, I hope you have a nice day? Because if you do, you should. And even sometimes when you don't, you should try to. And that level of connection, just human to human connection, grows exponentially when you focus on it. And then when you put it into a work context and focus it even further, you can make a huge impact. Wow. Well, you have made a huge impact here today. This has been so fun, so amazing. And I hope we can do this again, talking about more topics like this, because I think um, your perspective is aligned with mine, but that we're just at different things. We do different things in the business. Absolutely. And so I learn something every time we talk, no matter what the, the circumstances are, whether it's uh, to cook better, you got to come up and help me figure out my new pizza oven because yep. I don't yes, know. I do. My, my proof of concept was not good. Okay. Or whether it's um, talking about relationships or whether it's talking about some of the cool hobbies that we have or whether we want to go as a business. It's always great talking to you. So um, do you have one, actually, as, as we sign off, do you have one thing that you would wish for everyone at as we go into the beginning of 2024? Something that you would pass out like, hey man, if anything, think this, do this, be this. I think, uh, and it, maybe it's a tad corny and I know I've heard it before, but what I would say is hope for the best in others and want the best for yourself. Mm. And if you're wanting the best for yourself and you're hoping the best in others, then you're gonna find opportunities to make those authentic connections. That's my perspective, or at least that's the one I'm gonna be adopting as best I can in 24, is try, hoping for the best in myself and hoping the best for others. Nice, well I tell you what, I know you speak for at least 25 to 30 of your team members, your fellow team members here, and they have done such a great job. You guys collectively ha are a massive part of what we do. We can't do what we do without you and your team. So thank you for that. And please tell them from all of us, if someone's watching or listening, you know, and from me, from my heart and all mm -hmm. the leadership team, tell them thank you and that we appreciate them. I absolutely will. And for those of you who enjoyed this, please pass it around, send it to someone. And until next time, keep making a difference.